Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on the program is Simon Gilbo, Evangelist to Burundi. Simon Gilbo, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thanks very much, great to be here. I'm delighted to have you here. Well, I'd like to start, Simon, first of all, with your grandparents. Your grandparents were missionaries in Africa. Tell us about that. Yeah, my grandfather was, was he got the title Senior Wrangler at Cambridge, so he was the top mathematician of his, of his year group. And his professor was like, no, as, as this top brain ended up going to just tell people about Jesus in Central Africa. They were saying, what a waste of this great brain. Uh, so he was incredibly gifted. And obviously, we, d we know that that wasn't a waste at all. Um, because he influenced the lives of literally millions of people because he put the word of God in, in Kinyarwanda, which is the local tongue. And I actually talk more about my, my granny because when grandpa died, aged 83, Granny was like, in England, you'll just stick me in an old age home. They'd spent 50 years in Africa. Whereas out in uh, Rwanda, I'm an Uchechu, I'm a wise old dame. So age 83, she went back out to Rwanda, started a widow's meeting, ended up having hundreds and hundreds. There were 15,000 widows in her diocese, literally from the genocide. And uh, Granny, Granny Gilbo's last day in action on planet Earth, they'd long prepared this massive widow's meeting. She's now 86 years old. And she preached, let rip on them, said goodbye like she knew. There's au revoir and adieu in French. Au revoir is to the re-seeing, adieu is till God. It's almost like the Spirit of God, a whisper to her, you're coming home, baby. And uh, she said goodbye. Last photo of her taken alive doing a traditional in holiday dance like that. And then she waddled home, had a game of Scrabble, and went to be with Jesus. And that was the end of her life. She fought the good fight, she'd run the race, she'd kept the faith, and now the crown of righteousness. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's my heritage. I'm extremely grateful for it. Amazing. Now, you, your, your personal encounter with Jesus um, was quite significant when you were at Harrow School and that's you right. went to a scripture union camp. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Well, so I was fi when I was 15, my mum sort of forced me to go to this camp and I was like, oh, do I have to? And she said, I'll just make you go once. Uh, and you never have to go again. I came back saying, I am going every Easter and summer for the rest of my life. And I, and I managed that for 10 years before God very dramatically called me to Burundi. So I see camps in general as having a critical role in, in the discipleship journeys of people. It wasn't dramatic, uh, age 15. I think I was waiting for a dramatic. I've had lots of dramatic since, but it was just a, a coherent presentation of the gospel. And uh, so I came to faith. I had a very mixed witness through school. I think uh, I, had, uh, I had a bunch of guys doing drugs and sort of one of the leaders there and also running the Christian Union. So, you know, it's slightly compromised maybe, but the Lord really laid hold of me on my year out. When I went to South Africa, I taught in a Sutu farm school in the middle of nowhere, miserable time as an extreme extrovert. And I was like, God, if you are real, I, I, I seriously need you right now. And it was almost like I was at crossroads. Are you gonna be, holy or you're gonna sleep with the farm women and, and probably get AIDS you know it was like it was so stark because I was so lonely so bored and thank the Lord I chose the better option and Absolutely. God met with me in power in those times in, the, in you know it was such a hard time but I'm the most grateful for that hard time because that's where I suppose knowledge became more internalized and real and I had an experience of uh, the Holy Spirit's power in me which is I hadn't at conversion, I suppose. Yeah, it's discipleship, really. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. And it's belief uh, being transformed into behaviour and mm -hmm. lifestyle. Now, you were doing a Bible course in London, and I love this story. You were getting to the end of this Bible course at Cornhill, yeah. um, and didn't know what you were going to do. And there was definitely a divine... Yeah orchestrated call for you to go to Burundi. But tell us what happened. Yeah, so I mean, I had, a, I suppose, a number of potential avenues to pursue. I thought maybe the Lord had called me to Cambodia. So I went and investigated that call. I mean, it was very gospel needy, 0.1% at the time, uh, uh, evangelical Christians out there. So I was like, anyway, it, I'd been praying throughout that year. I'd, I'd had a 
business job, I was on a conveyor belt of success, I'd had time out this, on this course, and I was like, God, I don't want security. I said, I don't want security, because security is the most best thing, because when we've got security, we don't, we don't sort of need God. So if I don't want security, I, I've got a girlfriend, I've got no strings, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. So this is the prayer I'm always trying to get people to pray. And it's a dangerous prayer on one level, but um, it's the best prayer to pray, it's full surrender. So I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere, I don't want security. And this guy tracked me down. It was the second last day of the course, and everyone else, I think, pretty much had their security, their job lined up for, the com- for Monday. And uh, I, I was like, come on, Lord, answer me. And this, this guy, this, this, I received a scribbled piece of paper with a name and number. Ring this guy, he wants to meet with you. So I rang the, the number. We arranged to meet on the last day of the course. And this guy, we met up in Bishopsgate in the city. I'd never met this bloke before. He starts speaking. You might even know him, you probably do. He goes, my name's Robert DeBerry. <laughs> I've been <laughs> praying. I believe God sent me to you. He wants you to Burundi, be involved in youth mission bands. And I'll <laughs> thumping my chest. God, is this what you've kept me for? So I said to him, all right, thanks, weirdo. I'll think about it. I'll be spiritual. I'll pray about it. Went back to my job. Actually, my job, they kept it open for me temporarily. I knew I wasn't going back long term, but they said, you can come back whenever you want. We, we like you. And so I was, I was back there. I was like, okay, God, right now, if that wasn't some nut job, if that was you, then that if I go to Burundi, it means it was actually the most dangerous country in the world at the time. So it means leaving family, friends, security, money, career, everything, going to a place where I might get killed, and people in the meantime did try to kill me. So give me a radical sign right now in front of the computer if you want me to go. And I didn't wait long, took a phone call, and the voice on the other end, out of the blue, said, do you know anyone who wants to work in Burundi? I was like, what? So, so that was it. I mean, what do you do with that? I tell that story well, so often. I say either I'm lying, but you wouldn't live for a lie for the last 23 years. Of course. Uh, or that was a coincidence, but we know that no, wasn't a coincidence. It was that not. That was a God incident. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And that was the start. Of the, that's 2, two Chronicles 16, verse 9. And he's like, who's up for it? <laughs> Simon Gilbert. He's fickle. He's got his issues. But... He wants to make his life count. Thank you, Lord. And it's been an unbelievable adventure. Now, you ministered out in Burundi for a number of years. You you came back. You went to all nations. That's where you met your wife, Lizzie. That's right. And then you both returned to Burundi. And uh, you lived out in Burundi how many years? Well, in 20, uh, for me, in total, it would have been about 20 years. 20 years of ministry. As you reflect on the, on those 20 years uh, living out in Burundi, tell us some of the, the stories of what you saw happen. Well, I mean, it, what, was, what was beautiful was just from the get-go, starting with nothing and then the Lord building the work in his time, on his timeline. So I, you know, I had nothing at the start. I got my, all my money stolen literally at the start. So I arrived with a couple hundred quid in, in the world and... Uh, uh, and so I went up to a guy, I said, can I borrow a bicycle? You know, I would have liked to have driven a fat four by four, but I'm the only Muslim in the country, sweaty Ming on the equator, sort of cycling to work. And, and uh, I only say that because, you know, 20 years on, you look back and you see that we've built five schools. Each school's the best in its province. We built this $5 million uh, conference center, which is the best hotel in the country. And one of our values would be excellence in Jesus' name. So Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. It's for the Lord, not for men. And so we, we, we've, got, we've got sort of, um, uh, yeah, we, uh, medical centers. And so there's a lot of infrastructure, but it started with, with, with nothing and just going in God's time. And, and after a few months off the motorbike, the Lord released some money. So I brought, bought a motorbike and went to the market and bought matching shades of sort of 50p with my brilliant soulmate, Freddie. And then we're blasting around the hills on the most dangerous countries in the world, literally the most dangerous countries in the world. And one time 40 people got killed and we got through. Not having a death wish, but definitely living, Philippians 1, 21, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, wrote Paul. What shall I choose? He says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but convinced there's more work for me to do. I'll be around, around a bit longer. And I remember singing in our helmets, praising the Lord in the Switzerland of Africa, thinking, this is great. And if we die, what a great way to go. I mean, it was just phenomenal. And the Lord just building, building his work. And it was very much, it was organic. It was, it was, it was very fruitful because... Burundi is just very fertile. It's so easy to see people come to faith. But I, th- I think it'd be worth mentioning, after three years preempting burnout, my, yes. my, my sort of seniors in England through CMS, Church Mission Society, they said, look, you're, you're gonna burn out, come back. And those three years particularly, I lived 
expecting to die every weekend because it was guerrilla warfare and driving on those roads, they were, they were death roads. And so, it, by the way, it's a great way to live, expecting to die, because if you think you're gonna die, you're not gonna waste a day. You're not gonna get excited about new carpet fitting. You, you know, because anything, as C.S. Lewis says, anything which is eternal is eternally out of date. It doesn't last. You're gonna say sorry to anyone you've offended. You're gonna want to have your house in order. You're gonna tell everyone you know, you know, uh, your, the, the hope that you have and why you're doing what you do. So they, they were great years. But preempting burnout, I came back, as you mentioned, I was at yeah. All Nations, and the big takeaway from that time at All Nations was that actually, Simon, you know, you were a turbocharged nut job for those three years, but it was unsustainable, and actually it wasn't the most effective. You don't need to be preaching every second of every day. How about, and this was it, Ephesians 4, we know these verses, uh, 12, 13, you know, the, the pastor, a pro, a pros, apostle, prophet, teacher, their job is not to do the teaching, the prophesying, the, the, the evangelizing, it's to equip God's people to do it, and therefore multiply yourself out. And so I just returned uh, to Burundi with Lizzie, uh, and, and it's like, in, instead of me preaching like a turbocharged headless chicken, how about creating a movement of Burundians, Simons, and Simones, who are gonna be way better anyway, because it's their language, their culture, their context, their proverbs, etc. cetera. And, and that's what we've done. So I don't need to be in Burundi right now because Today, hundreds will be coming to the Lord through the people we've equipped and trained up, and, and that is absolutely gorgeous. And I want to honour Lizzie in that process because absolutely. she's been remarkable. When I proposed to her, I said to her, I was delirious of malaria as well at the time, I said, are you ready to be a young widow? And, uh, and she bought into it, and she's been a great sort of That soulmate. was your proposal? Yes. <laughs> I borrowed a boat, uh, actually it was in Aranda, we on a, it was New Year's Day, um, in on Lake Kivu, and I borrowed a mate's motorboat out there, and I was like, uh, yeah. I mean, the night before, I said, are you ready to be a young widow? I was just, I had to see her out there in country, and uh, she, was, she was, yeah, I'll do that. Which is one thing, isn't it, with, a, with your wife buying into it, but then we have three kids, and what does it look like for them? And, and it looks different, but the thing I'd still insist on is that we are called to live by faith and not by fear. And the best thing I can model to my kids is a faith life and not a fear life and I think across the world we need to hear that because most of us live shackled by fear and we're fed fear uh, and and our birthright as well as of Jesus is to live free from fear by faith and even in the most dangerous country in the world which it was it's not now no but um, it was very liberating uh, but there was there were some remarkable encounters which you could say with evil. Uh, you returned home one day and there was a man standing outside your home with a grenade. Yeah. Uh, who'd written you a letter saying he wanted to gouge your eyes out. Yeah. So what happened there? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess he, had, he was traumatised, as a lot of the people would be, to, because I had not done anything really wrong to warrant that response. Um, and, yeah, he... he he basically, as you said, came to the house and, and said that, and I, and I, um, in the end, went to the head of police. I mean, I had nightmares for a while. I had to vary my routes around town. I stayed at a friend's house, but you know, even as we talk about Romans eight twenty eight, you know, God works for good in all the in all things. Um, I so value that death ray experience and the, the minor trauma that would have come out of that, because it was a, an epiphany for me to say, I don't think I'd ever thank the Lord that I could see. And faced with the reality of the imminent potential loss of eyes, let alone the rest of my body, it was like, thank you Lord, I can see. And, and what other things that I assume are rights, and we are certainly uh, speaking as English people here right now, uh, in an entitlement culture, um, how many things do I assume are rights when actually they're gifts, they're grace gifts, and everything, this would be my biggest lesson from Burundi, everything in life is a gift. And if you see everything in life as a gift, you are a grateful person and you're going to live in the grace of God. So I can see and I've got a body that works and I can read and write. And I think of a young girl, one of our youth camps, she stood up and she confessed to sleeping with a priest to get three pounds to carry on her education. And, you know, I don't judge her at all because any, any lady listening right now, you probably would have done the same because otherwise you'd still be illiterate in first grade. And We've got access to healthcare as my pastor's 18 year old brother died in his arms again because he didn't have three pounds for the medicine across the counter. That is so wrong. 
And we, yeah, and we are so blessed to have access in the Western world to, to healthcare and stuffing our face. Burundi is the hungriest country in the world right now. And so I, we got freedom, most of us, uh, certainly in the Western world, to say Jesus as Lord as maybe 250,000 million Christians in, across the world in 40 plus countries live under oppressive regimes where they don't have that freedom. So when I'm tempted to discouragement or self-pity or woe is me, as I'm sure many of us are at different times, I just go through the grace gifts of God in my life. My and, and, I mean, I've written a book on this called Sacrifice. It's just yes. an exposition of Romans 12. But in view of God's mercy, the Greek word is called mercies, in view of his mercies, get on the altar and surrender out of gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. And be all in and he is faithful. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. You're, Simon, you're fearless. Um, and so many people today are fearful. So how do we combat fear? Well, I mean, good question. I think a uh, scripture that comes to mind is, is take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when those, th 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 those thoughts, those negative, those fearful thoughts come, bring them t to Jesus and say, you know, it was perfect love casts out fear. It's another scripture. We're not meant to live under that fear. We're meant to live through, through faith. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? I mean, think about that. You know, ultimately, we know our, our end destination. We're going to be with Jesus forever. That's where we're headed. We've got total assurance of what he's done for us you know, on the cross. So it's, uh, it's coming back to the promises of God. I, I'm very into scripture memorization. I love story up, store up God's word in your heart. Speak scripture to yourself so that you're listening to the right voices. So acknowledge the wrong voices. Don't, don't live in denial of, of, the, of the reality, but, but bring Christ's light to shine on them. I mean, those would be a few things that come to mind. That come to mind. While in, in Burundi, did you see miracles? Did you see healings? Did you see deliverance? Yes, I mean, that's another beautiful thing. I think uh, in, in developing countries, that because there isn't necessarily a doctor, I mean, I can't think of doctors as this, but in Burundi, for example, there's one dentist per million people, literally. <laughs> 11 million, 11 dentists. Um, so with doctors, it would be a bit more, but you know, you haven't got the chance. You can't just ring up, I'm sick, I go, go to the doctor. So and there's a greater desperation, a greater need for God and a greater level of faith because actually in our context, they know the power of Satan because they've, they've seen the power of the witch doctor. If you mess with him, bzz, he'll curse you and you know, there'll be horrible consequences. So there's, there's, there's a reality of engagement with the spiritual realm, which means that it's very fertile for seeing uh, the power of the gospel. So in terms of praying for people and seeing demons cast out, uh, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name. And they do like blasting that out, like, uh, you know, in Jesus' name. Um, I mean, I've got loads of stories. My, one of the favorite things we've done is that over the last 15 years, we sent out every summer for two weeks. So barring last year because of COVID, we sent out uh, an average of 700 young men and women evangelists into the bush in different teams, accompanying the local church to model it to them and empower them. Um, so that's 15 years times 14 days times eight hours a day of outreach. Um, that's a lot of very intentional outreach times 700 people. And we guesstimate, and I know, you know, we evangelists, we get accused of being evangelistic with our numbers, uh, but we guesstimate that 170,000 people have come to Jesus. And the stories are legion. And any, just about any miracle from the Acts of the Apostles, like a substitute, Kido Undo or Bukidasazi or Ngozi, and, and say a similar story. And some of them are so nuts that, honestly, even in this context, I'm not sure I would share. But, I yeah. mean, you've seen it. It's, it's the stories we read in the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. You have seen that yourself. Mm, yeah, no, it's wonderful. It's a Would real you, crazy. Simon, pray for our viewers, any that are feeling oppressed, any that do need a miracle, any that need healing, would you pray for all of our viewers now? Yeah. Father God, I pray for anyone listening right now who is shackled by fear, anxiety, distress, and we break that in Jesus' name. Will you meet with them? Lord, thank you that you will meet all our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are trustworthy. That is your character. And so will you meet right now any physical sickness, 
anything that needs addressing, any relationship break breakdown, any forgiveness or unforgiveness that needs addressing. We bring it to you. And through the power of the risen Christ, we say, have your way and make all things new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon, for praying. Your ministry, Great Lakes Outreach. How did you come up with that name? Um, well, we're in the Great Lakes region of Africa, not, so not America. So we have a branch in America and there's a bit of confusion there with their Great Lakes. But uh, Lake Kivu, Lake Victoria, we're on Lake Tanganyika. It's the longest lake in the world, second deepest. So it, it just gave us scope to go beyond into Rwanda, across into Congo, down into Tanzania, although we are focused on Burundi, because Burundi, Rundi, even means the other. Everyone listening, you've heard of Rwanda. You probably haven't heard of Burundi. It's like the other forgotten place, but it's not forgotten by God. And so we're very much concentrated there. And um, it is a beautiful work. And I can, I, I can say that bragging about God's work there because it's not my way, it's his work. And, and the beauty of it is that our, our sort of strapline would be to identify, empower and equip the best local leaders, Burundian leaders, men and women of passion, integrity, gifting and vision for the transformation of the nation, bottom up and top down. So... Brilliant brothers and sisters, all the most amazing brothers and sisters I've ever met have been brilliant. But, you know, if you've suffered rape and pillage and war and displacement, refugee, all that stuff, and you've still got faith, there's incredible refining that's taking place and they are jewels and gems and diamonds. And so, you, you know, often if you, well, if you back, and we are sort of backing, getting behind people, if you, if you back an average person, the good person, your, your, your ceiling, if you like, is mediocrity or, or good. But if you can get behind great people, the sky's the limit. And for the glory of God, we have got some, well, he has got some stunning troops. And so we're just saying, how can we transform the nation? We'll just get behind you and we'll resource you and mentor you and equip you and bless you. And it is absolutely gorgeous. Amazing. You, you've written um, a number of books. Mm -hmm. uh, I have got one book here. More Than Conquerors. I, I do like your titles, Simon. Uh, tell us about this book and some of your other resources. Yeah, so it's um, More Than Conquerors. Um, the subtext there is a call to radical discipleship. So my sort of philosophy would be, would be how far is too far when Jesus on the cross went that far? And he didn't go that far for us just to be nice people. Uh, the gospel is not about being nice. It's about so much more. And you, you'll know this, but More Than Conquerors, that comes from Romans 8, um, 37, we are more than conquerors. But Romans 8, 37, obviously 37 comes after 35. And 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. So it's recognizing as a spiritual battle and that if this is contested and, and Satan is, is powerful, he's defeated, but he's powerful, we need to be on our guard. And so it touches on all those things. And there's, there's also 13, sort of there's 13 chapters. There's a DVD series that accompanies it. So that could be of interest to people. Um, the other, I mean, I've written a number of books, but the other one I would think I would highlight because we've done, a, we've done it through last year as a daily devotional. It's called Choose Life. Yes. And Choose Life, um, it came out of me actually being in bed. I didn't say in bed for two years, but in Burundi I suffered sort of whether it was a, uh, virus or chronic fatigue and I was lying in bed and I was like Lord what's going on and and, and choose life I could in, in, for me in bed I could either choose self-pity and despair or I could choose to see what the Lord wanted to do in and through me and, and praise God that book you know it was it's voted devotion of the year you know it's, it's it has really impacted people are we going to choose apathy or urgency are we going to choose uh, cynicism or action are we going to choose grumbling or gratitude. So it's a daily shot in the arm and, and I do a weekly vlog with that as well that comes out. So if anyone wants to sign up for that, I would love that. You know, some of our co choices are really un inconsequential. What did you have at breakfast? Some of them are much bigger and I've touched on it before. Faith or fear, what are we gonna choose? Uh, obedience or disobedience, uh, clarity or trust. I mean, the list goes on. So I'd love people to, to check that out because that that is and you've got a podcast as well got a podcast called inspired um again i think what i see is that as, as you just bless people the blessing comes back so the idea is i get my mates on a bit like this 
uh, but it's just uh, audio. And uh, they just tell their stunning stories of faith. It points to Jesus, glorifies Jesus. We have so much rubbish news that we're just being bombarded with. And this is beautiful stories of costly, triumphant faith from around the world. And that's, so that's called Inspired with Simon Gilbo, but each week it's inspired with Nicky Gumbel or James Ray. Yesterday I interviewed James, you know, it's whatever. So different people. And uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful because it just builds faith, stirs faith. So that's, that's inspired, yeah. The, the Queen honoured you and your wife Lizzie with an MBE, uh, which was a great encouragement, not just for you and Lizzie, but your entire team and ministry, uh, recognising and honouring uh, the work that you have done and are doing. Uh, how was it when you went to receive your MBEs? Yeah, it was lovely. And, you know, very much, as you said, we took it for the team because we are just part of a beautiful body of Burundian brothers. And sisters. We are so close. We have faced death together. Our relationships are so deep. Um, and so as we got it, I mean, a little moment that was wonderful is that I am very um, uncultured in terms of <laughs> um, classical music. And I think I could name sort of, uh, what's that, Hallelujah, Han is that Handel's Messiah? Handel's Messiah. Okay. The only other one I <laughs> could name would, I can't even, I can name the composer, it was Rachmaninoff. Because when we came into our wedding, la 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 la, anyway, that bit. Uh, so that's what we, Lizzie came into uh, when we got married. So that's the only other piece I could actually name. And, and you know, there's about, I don't know, about 100 people receiving their OBs, CBs, MBs. And just as we stepped forward to receive ours, uh, there was a rolling minute live live orchestra or whatever uh, in Buckingham Palace. So there's a, there's a, you know, it was a, about a minute of different songs blending into each other. And just as we stepped forward, la, 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 la. And I was like, Lord, that's just a little thing. This is for your glory. Yes, we're meeting. It wasn't actually the Queen. It was Prince Charles. But, you know, it's nice to meet you, Prince Charles. But, Lord, you're so good. And it's the audience of one, and that's the main thing. Absolutely. And, well, it was a... Lovely recognition to be honoured by royalty, but the Lord honours you, Simon, and your wife, Lizzie, and your family and your team, and may you continue to know God's favour upon you. Thank you very much. In these much. days, years ahead, that you'll see the church enriched and the kingdom extended in Burundi and beyond. An absolute joy, Simon, to have you on Facing the Canon. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. Wow. Did that give you a faith lift? Well, it certainly gave me a faith lift and I feel really inspired and encouraged and I hope you are as well. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again next week. <laughs>